Okay. The objectives of this course are that by the end of the session, you'll be able to describe ways of identifying patient needs with particular emphasis on circumstances that may interfere with treatment. You'll be able to describe the impact of substance abuse on treatment for TB and latent TB infection, and discuss ways to support clients in substance abuse therapy. You'll also be able to assist homeless clients in obtaining services which will support their treatment for TB and latent TB infection. Our faculty today are Paul Colson, the Program Director at the Charles Salton National Tuberculosis Center at Harlem Hospital, Rhonda Hagler, Medical Director of the East Orange Substance Abuse Treatment Center, and Suzanne Gunston, from the pro uh, who is Program Manager of the State of Maine TB Control Program. Today's conference will occur, uh, will, will have three parts. First will be a presentation about what the surveillance data from TB control programs in the Northeastern region can tell us about the extent of TB disease among homeless and substance using populations in the region. And he will outline uh, effective strategies for working with these hard to reach populations. Second, we'll learn about a program in East Orange, New Jersey that has been effective in treating substance users who have TB disease and latent TB infection. Third, we'll have a chance to learn how one program, the State of Maine, has developed effective approaches to working with homeless clients. If time permits, we'll have one or two questions. TB surveillance there on homeless and substance using patients in the Northeast region, and a discussion for strategies for working with these hard to reach populations. I'd like to turn to Dr. Paul Colson to explore these subjects. Dr. Colson is the program director of the Charles P. Felton National Tuberculosis Center. He has a doctorate in social work and has many years of experience working with clients who are homeless and have issues with substance use. Paul? Yeah. Thank you, Bill. Um, Okay, who is it we're talking about in this webinar today? Um, for this presentation, we're discussing people who are homeless, substance users, which includes injecting drug users and other drug users, and people who use alcohol to access. These people may also be HIV positive, have mental illness, be ex-offenders, or be living in poverty. Why is it difficult to serve this population? But tuberculosis treatment may be a low priority for this group. Their adherence may be impacted by their homeless condition or by their substance use. They generally have a multitude of needs, and they also suffer from a lack of resources. Why is it important to make special offers with these groups? One is for their individual sake that their declining health status um, is problematic, and obviously we want to help people be as healthy as possible. Um, by being rapidly treated, they may develop MDR TB, and obviously there's a concern about transmission of TB if people are inadequately or, or not treated at all. Uh, and obviously that, that transmission could be of MDR TB. So I'd like to briefly show you some statistics, um, and these are statistics that were reported in a report called Report of Tuberculosis in the United States 2005, um, and these tables individually report a certain condition, whether homelessness, injecting drug use, non-injecting drug use, or excessive alcohol use within the past 12 months of TB diagnosis. The first table shows TB cases by homeless status. And one of the four of these tables is in the first row give you the U.S. statistics. Um, so this shows that there's 795 uh, cases that were identified as being homeless in the entire United States, and that represented 6.1% of all TB cases. That homeless people represent 6.1%. The remaining rows are the jurisdictions served by the Northeast ITMCC. And what I've done is highlight in orange on each of these slides which jurisdictions have rates that are higher than the national rates. 
Um, in this case, you see that both the District of Columbia and Ohio show higher rates. Uh, and also, counting all four of these tables is at the very bottom, in red, is a row that shows you which jurisdictions had zero cases of that condition. So as you see, Delaware, Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont had no homeless cases in the past 12 months. Okay. This table is arranged the same as the previous table, but presents statistics on people who are injecting drug users. In the United States, there are 282 cases, uh, which represent 2.2% of the national cases as injecting drug users. Eight jurisdictions in this region had higher than the national percentage. And uh, I don't need to read through all of those. You can see those. Um, again, at the bottom, there are three jurisdictions that had no cases of injecting drug use in the past 12 months. <laughs> now, obviously, with any statistics, you have to reserve some caution about interpreting them. You may notice that Vermont, at the bottom of the table, has the highest rate. It's 13.3%, but that only represented one person. So I'm guessing that they probably had seven cases in all, and one of them was by injecting drug users that resulted in what appears to be a high rate. Now we'll move on to the statistics of people who are drug users but did not inject drugs. Uh, the United States had 1,004 such cases, and that represented 7.8% of all the U.S. cases. Five jurisdictions in the Northeast had rates higher than the U.S. rate. And again, as you see at the bottom, four jurisdictions had zero cases of non-injecting drug users. Delaware, Maine, New Hampshire, and Rhode Island. And finally, we'll look at a table on excessive alcohol use. The United States had 1,789 cases. There are 13.9 percent of the total TB cases. Five jurisdictions in the Northeast had higher than national rates. And one jurisdiction had zero cases. That's New Hampshire again. Actually, if you remember across all four slides, New Hampshire appears each time with zero cases of homelessness, injecting drug use, um, non-injecting drug use, or excessive alcohol use. Um, now, you may have a particular interest in the statistics reported uh, for your jurisdiction. You may already know these statistics. Um, I think the point to be made from this, obviously, is that these conditions are common in the people we're treating. Drug use, alcohol use, homelessness. Um, no jurisdiction seems to be immune from these issues. Um, and um, for the most part, even if uh, jurisdiction didn't have greater than the national rate, it, it's uh, often still present. With the exception of New Hampshire, evidently. I'd like to move on now to talking a little bit about establishing rapport with homeless and substance abusing clients. These next slides cover basic information about establishing rapport and maintaining a relationship with homeless or substance abusing clients. These techniques do not differ for these populations than from other populations. However, it's important to give attention to this because many such individuals have had bad experiences getting services, either from the healthcare system or from social services. For example, they may have felt that their confidentiality wasn't maintained or that they were treated in a disrespectful manner because of their situation. This is a reminder that despite the particular situation, these clients deserve the same treatment as our other clients. Um, now, it's important to establish the power tone in your first encounter with the patient. Um, building rapport is an important thing, and if you don't establish rapport with a, a client or a patient, this will lead to the difficulties down the road during treatment. Before rapport can be established, the client must be respected. You should start by introducing yourself and describing your role, whether you be a nurse, a DOT worker, an outreach or each worker, etc. You should discuss confidentiality, and you should understand the specific concerns 
that a particular patient may have about confidentiality. For example, could be that he doesn't want his family to know that he's in TB treatment. Or could be that she doesn't want other shelter residents to know that she's in TB treatment. It's important to explain the purpose of your interaction and be clear about the intent of the interaction. If, if the client senses something is being kept from him or her, then they won't be forthcoming either. And while sometimes it's difficult, it's important to have a non-judgmental attitude. Clients or patients will pick up on negative attitudes, and this creates a barrier in your working relationship. You don't need to approve everything that a client says. You just need to accept the fact that they said it. Active listening is a way of listening that focuses entirely on what the other person is saying. It confirms understanding of both the content of the message and the emotions and feelings underlying the message. Let's talk a little bit more about active listening now. It's important to focus on the other person and to use attentive body language. That is, you sit slightly forward or with a relaxed and easy posture. Use verbal cues such as, uh-huh, sure, ah, yes. And you should ask for clarification when you don't understand something that the client has said. It's a good idea to use open-ended questions to get more information. Open-ended questions start with who, what, where, when, why, or how. And they cannot be answered with a simple yes-no answer. For instance, how do you spend your time after leaving the shelter in the morning? That's an open-ended question. Do you go to the drop-in center? That's a closed-ended question. And the problem with closed-ended questions is the person will give you a brief response and then you have to ask another question and another question. So often, if you want to get rich information, it's better to ask an open-ended question. And it's important to paraphrase the statements of the client. This demonstrates that you're really listening and also prompts them to give you more detail. Now, a few thoughts about maintaining a relationship with a client through treatment. To continue the good rapport you established at the beginning of your relationship, it is important to show the client respect and acceptance. You should try to avoid assuming that you know what the client understands about TB and its treatment. It's good to periodically review key issues, such as why she or he has to be observed taking medications, or why they have to be on treatment for so long. You statements can be perceived as judgmental or insulting, such as saying things like, you made us run all over town when you didn't show up for your appointments. A better option might be to say, we were concerned that something might have happened to you which prevented you from coming in. People generally find it easier to accept information when you present it positively, highlighting the benefits rather than stating negative consequences. Rather than telling clients that alcohol and INH don't mix or that they should stop drinking, you should use messages that reinforce TB treatment without judging. For instance, you could say, our goal is to help you complete treatment and return to good health. If you reduce your drinking, the medications will work better. Remember that people often present their frustrations and disappointment on others, particularly those who happen to be in the vicinity when they're feeling those things. Most of the groups we're discussing today are often forced by circumstance to use manipulation to get as much goods and services as they can. Some of these people have developed a keen ability to size up other people and exploit their weaknesses or maybe say, figure out the best appeal to make to get what they want. When I worked with homeless men in a New York City shelter, we ran a group where we got these men to describe how they sized up people when panhandling. We then helped them modify these skills to a more positive event, such as making sure that their opinions or their needs were heard when dealing with welfare workers, with social security workers, etc. The latest issue of the Northeastern ITMCC's Cultural Competency Newsletter has a rich description of difficulties found when working with meth users in Washington State and how these TV workers adapted their methods in working with this group. So I greatly recommend that you take a look at that issue of the newsletter. From my years of working with homeless people, I'd like to make a few observations. While some homeless people or substance users certainly treat this manipulation of the game 
Remember that many of them have very little in their lives, and thus really need the food, clothing, and other incentives we provide. So it's easy to get angry about being manipulated, but you should realize that your unchecked anger can lead to a bitter and miserly approach to clients. Uh, you're essentially picking on powerless people. Finally, these clients can try your patience, so it's important to try to remain objective. In case conferences, case management meetings, etc., it's often better to acknowledge your frustrations about working with a particular client than to hold on to this. This allows you to get these feelings off your chest, allows your colleagues to offer you support, and then they also offer suggestions about different ways to deal with this client that you are not able to see. As you build trust with a client, it can really open doors. In our LTBI program, we have one client with paranoid schizophrenia who was not in psychiatric treatment but didn't want to hear about it. After several months of working on LTBI adherence and other less threatening problems this man had, our worker was able to convince him to go into a psychiatric day treatment program, something he never would have accepted at the beginning of the relationship. The final point here on this slide relates to something that counselors call termination. Now, most of us may think that a person finishing TV treatment is entirely a positive thing. But clients, on the other hand, may not view it in such a positive way. They may only see it as the end of the support they're getting, the end of the incentives they've been receiving, uh, the end of a nice relationship that they might have valued quite a bit. Unconsciously, it might even remind them of times in their past when they've been abandoned. So you can try to lessen these effects in a couple ways. One is to try to remind the client throughout treatment of the time frame and the fact that at the end of it, these services will end. Another thing is to try to identify ongoing forms of support that they could have after the TB treatment is completed and make appropriate referrals. Uh, the last slide shows some of the uh, sources for the materials I've been talking about, and I think that also appears earlier in the slides. Um, I'd like to thank you very much and turn it back over to Bill Barr. Okay. Thanks, Paul. Um, that was a really great overview of the epidemiology in our region, as well as some really practical tips of dealing with these sort of clients in common tuberculosis control situations. We do have some time for questions now, so I would invite you to get in touch with us either by sending us a text question using that chat mode, which is on the right part of your screen, or just call in by phone. I'd like to remind you to unmute your phone. Uh, if you have a question or a comment, you press star, uh, pound six. Pound three to unmute, and then you can speak with us, and then remember to remute your phone using star six um, after you've finished asking your question. So please, the lines are open. Um, send us a question or ask us. Bill? Yes. Hi, this is Nick Metropolis. How are you? Hi, Nick. Good. I uh, just have one question. Uh, um, I was just wondering if, uh, um, if we have any information how uh, focus groups uh, work among the homeless people in order to uh, better serve them and uh, maybe as a vehicle to um, let them um, express uh, their uh, concerns or uh, feelings about a particular program uh, to which uh, they uh, participate? Well, I would say probably the term is more of a support group than a focus group. Often focus groups are term that's used to elicit opinions about a certain thing. A support group is where people can express their feelings and, and get support from other members of the group. Uh, I've been involved quite a bit uh, with homeless men in, in running support groups, and I think it is a valuable tool. Uh, we've also used that modality for delivering information about HIV prevention um, and tuberculosis, in fact. Um, so I yeah, would address that. I, I'm not sure if there's something else you 
would like me to comment on that. No, I, I thank you. I think that was okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly, I guess I should add too that the the value uh, in a support group as opposed to just individual counseling is that people can hear others with similar concerns and it, it helps to normalize the feelings that they may be experiencing and they realize they're not the only one who's, you know, feeling depressed about living in a shelter or, you know, confused about sort of where their life is going or, or a variety of things. So that's the value of the support group. That's great, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, we have, uh, we have experienced a similar uh, thing, yes. Thanks. Sure. Are there other questions? I have a question. Hi, this is Mark Dunbar from uh, Seattle, Washington. Okay. So I, I kind of want to address uh, Nick's previous question uh, about a focus group. You know, that's a really good question. And we uh, specifically had a focus group amongst the homeless population here in Seattle. We had a huge outbreak in 03. And anyway, uh, this focus group was really centered around client treatment and how we could better serve them because, you know, they're predominantly downtown, in and out of various shelters, and then our hospital or our current clinic is up the hill. It's, you know, it's a, short, it's a long walk or it's a kind of a long bus ride, so... Anyway, the point of this focus group is how we could better serve them, and what we were able to do was establish a satellite clinic downtown, and it's really helped us with further screening for TLTBI as well as, uh, you know, medication, um, COT adherence, and things like that. So it, it's, uh, the focus group, if you can ever get a chance to do it, is really quite helpful. Mm -hmm. I agree. I mean, I think focus group, uh, well, support groups can... Um, be an additional way to try to bring people into care and provide support to them. And obviously, you know, you'd want to have some refreshments or things as, you know, you know, some people may share a group if they think it's just going to be a bunch of people sitting around talking and they may need the inducement of the fact there'll be some free food there to get them there and then they realize the value of the group once it starts going. And if the facilitators are open and honest about letting people express what they need to express um, can be very beneficial. We still have time for another question or two. Is, does anyone want to take the floor? Yeah, hello, Bill. My name is Faith Martinez. I'm public health advisor. I haven't started doing DOT yet, but I have known some situations when speaking to other public health advisors where, um, you know, you was talking about the um, uh, exact emotional upheaval and, and the treatment is. You know, and some patients might, you know, because of the incentives that they get and the attention that they get, and just before the end of treatment, they become non-compliant, you know, because they're getting this attention, this conversation and all. So how would, you know, how would one handle that, you know, to, treat, to keep the patient compliant because of the emotional stress, you know, the emotional stress of breaking off? Mm -hmm. Well, a couple of things. As I said before, I, I think it's a potential problem that if you let a tester, it's harder to sort of work your way out of. And that's why I was suggesting that you remind the client of the time limits and, well, the anticipated end of treatment for that person. Um, I think it's also important to remember that it's not about you as a worker when the client behaves in this way. Um, and it's, it's hard for people not to take it personally and become angry themselves that the client is suddenly sort of misbehaving after what could be months of good adherence and, and you know, what seemed to be, you know, a smooth path towards completion. Um, so in terms of something not being compliant, obviously um, whatever laws and regulations your jurisdiction follows in, in terms of enforcing um, participation and treatment would, would take place. Um, again, if, if you try to offer things that the client might need so they see the situation as not just loss and losing good things but having things replaced, um, that's a lot of helping them through changes, 
but hopefully they could see that it's not a, a net loss, that um, while well, one service will end, some others will pick up. Okay. Okay, that's all the time that we plan for questions now, but I'd like to remind you at the end of the session, we will also leave it open for questions to all of the panelists. Now that we have a common understanding of the extent of the TV burden in our region with these two hard-to-reach groups and a review of some effective strategies for reaching them, let's look more in depth at the challenges of working with TV clients who are substance users. I'd like to turn to Dr. Rhonda Haggard to talk about her, how her program has worked with substance users in East Orange, New Jersey. Dr. Hagler has a diploma in internal medicine and a certificate in, ad in addiction medicine, and years of experience in medical practice, public health, and the teaching of medicine. Her major research interests are in medical care of minority populations, pain management in sickle cell disease, and substance abuse treatment. Dr. Hagler? Good morning. I hope I'm coming to loud and clear. I welcome all the participants uh, to this um, conference. Uh, my experience, um, I'm here today to share with you um, our experience as a treatment facility in offering on-site treatment for LTBI. Uh, the East Coast Substance Abuse Treatment Center is a center primarily focused on the treatment of opiate addiction and dependence, and we do that by offering medically assisted therapy with methadone for those populations. Um, clearly, we've come to realize that all substance users are at high risk, um, the non-ID the, the non drug user as well as the drug user. Uh, as a point of fact, all illicit substances, the ones of abuse anyway, uh, cause alternation that's just attractive to their use. Uh, they lead to poor alternative status sometimes, poor judgment, increased risk-taking. So we, as a treatment provider uh, do not distinguish between non-IBGUs and IBGUs. They're all at risk. Many of our patients are homeless by virtue of the financial rigors that are associated with maintaining an addictive lifestyle. Um, as Paul noted previously, many substance abusers are homeless uh, for various reasons. They are shuttled between family members because of where they're welcome here. They're incarcerated on occasion. Um, many of our patients are HIV infected as well, and as you well know, uh, a concomitant infection with tuberculosis will only work in the prognosis for that particular patient. And also, most importantly, many substance abusers that we treat are immigrants to this country. They are actually, their countries of origin have extremely high rates in some instances of tuberculosis. In addition, many of these uh, patients are here not legally, so they have a great fear of uh, following up with medical care anywhere. They don't go to clinics, they don't usually go to hospitals because of that fear. Uh, barriers to treatment in this population, uh, substance abusers present with unique problems. And if you don't recognize those at the outset, you're going to be less likely in engaging those patients with preventative care and treatment. Most importantly, as an addict, their addiction needs will always supersede their health care needs. Uh, the addiction cycle is primarily focused on all efforts being spent of acquiring the means to get drugs and in using drugs. It's a vicious cycle, and until you break that cycle, uh, you're not going to be very successful in having a patient attend to what they need to do about their health. In addition, I've mentioned previously the lifestyle um, you know, leads uh, to transiency, uh, homelessness, outright homelessness, incarceration. As such, you can understand that these patients uh, cannot be compliant with follow-up medical visits. They can't be compliant with even keeping track of their medication. We've also often found that when we are able to uh, capture somebody who skin test positive for TB, and we refer them to a local health department, and therefore then a hospital for a chest x-ray, uh, and then require them to self-administer their medication, we're placing multiple obstacles in the past for that patient. Uh, especially our patients when they're new to treatment, clearly they are going through the rigors of a new lifestyle. They're trying to become illicit drug free. Um, they are sometimes withdrawing, and one more obstacle in that path is just, it's, it's fraught with failure if you're attempting to get to a common goal of ultimate treatment. Uh, many of our patients lack the understanding of the difference between what it means to be infected or exposed to tuberculosis as opposed to having the actual disease. So we try to help with um, clearing up that misunderstanding. 
Uh, many times we've actually found, and this is what led to our collaboration with the uh, New Jersey Medical School's Global TV Institute, was that when we finally got a patient to actually follow up with our recommendations to follow up on a positive skin test, and they were referred to their local health department, sometimes they were met with outright misinformation. They were told that they did not require treat, prophylactic treatment for LTBI, despite the fact that we all knew that as a substance abuser, they were at high risk. Um, they were, you know, told this because of outmoded concessions that it was an age limitation on INH um, drug therapy, which has since gone out the window. In addition, it's also important to understand that substance abuse in populations have a high incidence of mood disorders, particularly depression, which will definitely impact on anything that you want them to do. Their addiction treatment services, whether you're having them follow up for a positive skin test, um, it pretty much uh, will stop the energy out of the patient. They, it, it disorders their perception as to what's important and what's not important. Um, our collaboration came about um, because of a, a combined interest, I think, with the New Jersey Medical School for the TV Institute. They also recognized that drug users as a whole were a high-risk group. Uh, they recognized that the identification and the treatment of LTBI, TB, and the outright treatment could be better in this group, and they were actually working on trying to standardize treatment and testing. This was our goal as well because we were hoping to improve the aspects of care and treatment to our patients. They were very instrumental in coming into our clinic, uh, helping us uh, establish a very simple format uh, to be able to provide the service to our patients. In addition, they collaborated with a very streamlined uh, referral system so that patients who actually needed to be referred for evaluation of actual disease with an abnormal chest x-ray, uh, we had a streamlined uh, referral system down to the Global TB Institute. In addition, uh, several members, uh, particularly a nurse in particular at the New Jersey State Department of Health, uh, were, you know, saw the need uh, for treatment in this group, and they offered assistance with supplying us with iron and syringes. Um, you know, our clinic is a profit, we are fully grant funded, so, you know, we do not have access to unlimited financial uh, means. Uh, while we recognize that as a treatment facility that we could definitely diagnose and treat and monitor our patients with LTBI, we had one major stumble, and that was how to acquire chest x-rays in a population of patients who had no means to pay for them, and in most cases had no insurance at all. So we realized very early on that the East Coast Health Department uh, would be responsible for following up all the patients who had a positive skin test who resided in East Orange. And in fact, most of our patients are East Orange residents. In addition, we realized that every skin test positive would have to be evaluated by them, they would have to refer for a chest x-ray, labs, they would be responsible for treatment and follow-up. In addition, they also had a pre-existing contract with a local hospital to provide chest x-rays for all of the patients that they referred under a grant kind of funding. So we, we went to them with the approach of what can we do for you attitude as opposed to can we get something for free. So we approached them with the gift of possibly reducing their work burden, meaning we would keep all of our positive skin test patients in our clinic and we would treat them and follow them. So that was a little suspicious to them at the beginning. They kind of looked at us as Greek bearing gifts initially, but finally they got into the concept and they liked the concept. So we developed uh, a relationship whereby we would be able to refer all of our skin test positive patients to the local hospital where they had their contract, regardless of whether the patient was an East Orange resident or not. Um, as per the protocol that existed before our collaboration, the hospital would then check over the results of the chest x-rays on all the patients that they did, and then consequently the health department would check us our patient's specific reports. So, what uh, we do when we admit a patient is we will perform TB testing per protocol, and I will discuss that in a moment. In addition, all of our patients have to undergo, you know, what we consider mandatory seminars. In other words, just like counseling sessions are mandatory, we institute several health-related seminars where we discuss hepatitis, HIV, certainly tuberculosis where they are able to get some better understanding of why these conditions are important to them and what they can do to minimize their risk. 
In addition, once we do find a, a patient with LTBI, we are able to refer them directly to one facility without any confusion. There's no confusion about cost. They're not asking the patients to pay, and we're able to get very quick appointments. In addition, we offer on DOT therapy for LTBI. Not because obviously we we know that you know that is not necessarily the standard that you have to have somebody directly observed for treatment for LTBI. However, every patient in our clinic is being directly observed in their daily medication with methadone. So we con so we in consequence with that give them their INH as well. Um, our TB testing protocol is as follows: A patient is admitted to our facility. They undergo a comprehensive medical history and physical examination. The baseline blood work consists of a complete metabolic profile, a CBC, which is a complete blood count, a test for syphilis, which is the RPR, uh, hepatitis B and C serology, a urinalysis, and if pregnant, they will undergo a pregnancy test as well. If a patient does not have any documented history of having a tuberculosis and skin test, we will test them in a two-step manner. They have the first test placed at the day of admission, and then approximately two weeks later, they have the second test placed. If a patient can document that they were skin test negative within the six months prior to uh, their admittance into our program, we place the test at the time of their admission into our program, we consider that a complete two-step testing. For patients who just give us a verbal history of either a positive or a negative result, they will all undergo skin testing in a two-step manner. For our patients who do test uh, tuberculosis skin test positive, we refer them to the local hospital for the chest x-ray. If the chest x-ray is negative, the patient will meet with the physician to discuss the rationale and the benefits of treatment. Uh, this allows the patient to ask any questions about, you know, what the treatment consists of, any possible risks, et cetera. Uh, we then begin INA therapy, usually for nine months under a directly observed treatment protocol, um, except in a few instances, which I'll discuss in a minute. Once the patient has completed his, his uh, treatment, he will receive a permanent card, which is like a mini medical record of the date of his testing, his results, and the fact that he or she completed treatment. Now, when a patient has a positive chest x-ray, all of those patients are referred to the New Jersey Medical School's Global TB Institute for further evaluation, uh, treatment, and follow-up. Now, the only times in our clinic when we do not directly observe the therapy of, with INH is, number one, we are closed on Sunday, so all patients receive one take-home dose of methadone and their dose of, of INH. Also, there are patients who have been on our program for a period of time, usually not less than a year, when they achieve such stable status that uh, they are no longer using illicit drugs and they are able to monitor their own medication management. So they may pick up anywhere from two days to two weeks worth of medication. And if they happen to be also being treated for LTBI, the same would be had for the IMH. Um, at the time when they pick up their medications, however, the nurse is going over compliance Occasionally, they may pill count, etc. Now, when a patient skin tests negative, um, he is given a laminated card stating the date of the testing, what his skin test result was. Um, it's a permanent kind of uh, card. We encourage them to keep that in their wallet along with their driver's license, their social security number. For any number of reasons, patients may leave treatment. They may need to document that treatment in other facilities. They may be uh, having jobs that require documentation of a TB test, et cetera. And it's a good way for them to um, have that documentation. Now, patients who, for whatever reason, usually um, if a patient has to be discharged from our clinic because of rules violations, or we recognize the need for more intensive addiction treatment services, we then will refer that patient to their local health department of, of the city that they reside in for completion of their therapy. But we just do not leave the patient hanging out. We actually have the counselors and the nurses helping them make these appointments, and we are instrumental in contacting the facility so that we can start any treatment records that we will have on these patients. Now, this, you know, Paul kind of went over this, but, you know, you know, he's right. You know, the homeless and substance abuse populations tend to be difficult. You know, not so much, pretty much from uh, maybe it's wrong behavior because of the negative response that they have constantly coming across. They can be sometimes notoriously noncompliant. 
And some of the things that we kind of remembered in trying to engage our patients, because we've been fairly successful at doing that, is that we take the time to explain to the patient exactly why and what we're going to do to the patient. We also allow that patient to answer questions, um, to ask questions that are important to them. We do not assume what's important to them. We allow them to ask any and everything, and we try to answer to the best of our ability. We also reassure patients that staff is, and they're there and they're available. This is a little bit different than going to a clinic because every day they see some member of the medical staff. Usually it's the nurse every day before their medication. So that allows them an opportunity to ask questions that um, problems that arise. We also respect the patient's right to refuse treatment. Um, sometimes that happens. It's been there in my experience at our clinic that a patient will refuse treatment for LTBI, but we respect their right to do so. For our results, for the last three years during this collaboration, we've tested approximately 554 patients, 82 of which were tuberculosis and skin test positive. Two of the positives had um, further research been treated for tuberculosis, and three had been treated for LTBI. Six patients went AMA, just left the clinic for unknown reasons, sometimes due to incarceration, sometimes due to discontinued drug use. Uh, of the 71 that we treated, um, only one stop for adverse reactions, which were mild. It was abdominal pain and mild nausea, and one was incarcerated. So we pretty much had an 84, 85% um, completion rate. The advantage is clearly to being able to maintain uh, prophylactic treatment for LTBI at your facility would be that, number one, you streamline the process of getting chest x-rays for your patient by having one facility that you deal with. Uh, there's no wait for starting treatment, uh, which makes it quick and efficient. Um, DOT does increase the adherence rate and the efficacy. In addition, you're clearly able to closely monitor your patient for any signs and symptoms of toxicity. You do not have to wait weeks to find out that the patient is having a reaction to a medication that usually happens, you know, on a daily basis because the patients are seen daily. Um, in addition, we're aware that we are preventing cases of actual tuberculosis in the individual, and subsequently the community will benefit from this reduction in TB cases. Um, in addition, it's a nice thing to have a record of your testing and treatment. So, in summary, I just want to um, stress that this was a very simple uh, protocol to put into place. It really did help maximize the treatment for our patients because, believe me, they got all kinds of crazy advice when we sent them out to the community. We realized that even difficult, quote-unquote, patient groups could be successfully treated by just being humane, compassionate, and letting them feel truly that you were there to for their best health care needs. Um, education, we saw, was very important in getting our patients to accept what we said and in complying with our treatment protocol, just getting them to understand what it was and why it was. We also realized that compliance is definitely inversely related to complexity of treatment protocol. If you place 10 steps in front of a patient before you get to the end goal of treatment or cure or whatever, you're less likely to get to that goal unless you, as opposed to having just one step in that patient's path. Um, we clearly saw individual and community benefits with this kind of treatment, and having a patient have a mini medical record of their TB testing uh, prevented them from being retested because we have actually retested patients who were truly positive, um, but we had no documentation of that, and in some cases in other facilities are preventing them from being offered um, retreatment for LTBI. So I thank you for your attention and your time, and I'll close now. Back to Bill, and I'll wait any questions that anyone has. Thank you very much, Dr. Hagler. That was really interesting, and I'm sure the listeners are finding that um, it really was informative as to how this really can be done in their own program areas. Um, let's hear from you. Please send in written questions using the little text uh, chat box, or just unmute your phone using pound six and get on the line. Go ahead. Let me address a couple of questions that I see in the chat box. Um, HIV testing at our facility is recommended across the board. All patients are counseled, they're offered the test, they have the right to refuse or not. 
Um, we, in some cases, will provide transportation um, to appointments. Um, we clearly, like I said, one less step. If you give somebody a bus card or you tell them that they have to figure out a way to get there, you, you're less likely to get them to the clinic. So our clinic has uh, the convenience of having a grand transportation service that so we will transport. And in our population, we use a cutoff of 10 millimeters as a positive skin test. I hope that answered the question that I got in the chat side of this. Hello? Yes. Hi, this is Mother County, Rochester, New York. And uh, our program, our, our health department program, interfaces with our two methadone programs, one of which is right across the parking lot from us. So doing DOT is very easy. They just come to us and then they get their methadone. The other is a little further away, and in both situations, we've had the programs refuse to observe the INH because they say the regulations prevent them from doing anything but methadone. Can you comment on that? And I also am interested to know why you choose to do your DOPT or, or your DOT for LPBI daily versus twice a week. Oh, well, I'll respond to the last part of your question. We do it daily because, uh, you know, we've taken the protocol of a nine-month daily regimen as the first preferred treatment uh, into mind. Most of these patients are getting daily methadone, so it actually makes it easy um, for you. Know, you don't have to keep track necessarily of the schedule, et cetera. Also, as far as our methadone treatment facility in our state of New Jersey, we can offer other forms of treatment. Obviously, you have to be licensed to practice in the state. We will offer not only treatment for LTBI, but we do um, mental health sometimes um, uh, for treatment for anxiety disorders as well as depressive disorders. You know, with your facility and your setup, it makes it easy if your facilities are close together. Ours are not. So we have to farm out our patients to various uh, health departments across the state, actually. I mean, our, you know, our local region was East Orange, Newark, Elizabeth, New Jersey, Hillside. And so before our collaboration, we actually had to send all of these patients to these different facilities. And they got any number of responses back to them of why they were being sent there for a positive skin test, et cetera. So your facility, you know, that kind of setup, you know, let, lends to convenience. Uh, we, we're not so lucky to have our health department so to us like that. Did that answer the question? Hmm. Yeah, and apparently there are different regulations regarding what else can be done in different areas. So, right. Thank you. You're welcome. Nice program. Dr. Hager, it's Bill Byer. Um, there is a question that came text to me and it asks, in this collaborative <laughs> effort, who writes the order for treatment on these patients you refer? The health department or the EO clinic doctor? We do. I am a medical director there, and at this current time, the only physician there, so all orders for medication treatment come from me. So I review those orders definitely on a monthly basis. Uh, we're writing methadone on a monthly basis. We change orders on a daily basis depending on uh, levels of need. Obviously, if patients have problems either with too much or too little, not with the INA, but with the methadone, um, I'm changing those orders. And any orders for any change in medications comes through me either verbally or as a handwritten order. Thank you. The follow-up question is, are you also the same one performing the monthly monitoring? Uh, yeah, well, yes and no. I mean, I don't really see our patients every single day. I don't necessarily see each individual patient every day. I mean, it would be brought to my attention if a particular patient is having a problem that they would definitely make an appointment with the doctor or two for uh, further evaluation and follow-up. So we have an RN there that assesses, and she's quite competent in doing this, you know, the health status of the patient. So uh, I don't necessarily monitor every single patient. The nurses do. Very good. Uh, we have a question from Mark Warman. Mark? Hi, Doctor. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Um, my question is, uh, are you concerned about the HIV infected clients who may be false negative on TSD? Um, yes, we are. But, you know, I had a discussion with uh, one of the uh, pulmonary consultants um, that at this point in time, you know, a skin test negative is a skin test negative. I mean, back in the day, 20 years ago, they were putting antigen panels on, which is not considered, to my knowledge, standard of care anymore. 
So a true negative is considered a true negative, um, unless they have an abnormal chest X-ray that needs to be followed up. And that kind of high-intensity care is then referred to the Global TB Institute. We do not undertake that kind of uh, testing, sputum testing, monitoring, etc. In addition, they've never seen this, you know, when I, I talked to some of the uh, TB specialists from the Institute, they've never seen a time, because my question to them was, have you ever seen somebody who you actually documented as a true positive and then subsequent to either acquiring HIV disease or otherwise revert to a negative status? And the, and the doctors with all of their cumulative experience that I spoke to have never seen that. They have never had a case particularly of that particular situation. So that's what I was told. That's what they do. I mean, Gajita can speak to that more, but I think that if you're negative, because unless you have symptoms, uh, abnormal chest x-rays, they're getting followed up uh, really at the institute at that point. One last question along this line came in, and that is, what do you use as a cutoff for the positive skin test in the population you're working with? At the 10 millimeters. I think that's, thank you very much, Dr. Heidler. Um, very interesting, and really thank you for sharing your knowledge and experience with all of us. Um, the strategies that your program has used and the materials that you've developed will be useful to all of us as we consider adapting it and applying it in our own areas. I feel sort of a pressure of time now to make sure that we move on to the next subject. Um, now that we've seen in depth how one substance use program has worked with TB patients, let's take a look at how one state has worked with homeless TB patients. So I'd like to turn to Dr. Uh, excuse me, to Suzanne Gunston, the program manager of the State of Maine TB Control Program, to look at effective ways of working with homeless clients. Suzanne is a public health nurse with years of experience in communicable diseases, substance abuse treatment, HIV AIDS services and corrections, and most recently tuberculosis control. Suzanne? Hey, um, my name is Suzanne, and I hope I'm coming in loud and clear. I'm speaking anxiously awaiting spring. I hope to build on the presentations of Drs. Colton and Hagler, who provided epidemiological information and clinical strategies to support work with illness. Suzanne, could you speak up louder, please? My presentation will describe the process we used here in Maine to develop and implement shelter interventions aimed at limiting the transmission of TB in Maine's homeless shelters. I'll be describing a systems approach. Our recommendations and accompanying toolkit were the result of a statewide collaborative process that involved shelter and correction staff, medical providers, and health department personnel. Hopefully, you'll find our process useful in developing community-specific interventions for your own state. A link to our recommendations and toolkit will provide it as resources with these slides. Maine is very large geographically. Most of New England could fit within its borders. We have a case rate of 1.2, which is probably one of the lowest in the nation with a population of 1.3 million people. Most of our population is clustered in the southern part of the state. We have an aging demographic, aging <laughs> foreign-born population. Back in 2003, we had approximately 8,000 homeless people living in Maine. 35% of those were living in the Portland area. Prior to 2003, only one homeless TB case has been reported in the previous decade. In 2003, however, we had an outbreak. We had eight pulmonary cases, five were smear positive and linked by DNA genotyping. They were all homegrown U.S. born alcoholic males. They were all associated with either a specific shelter or a county jail. There were multiple exposure sites with more than a thousand contacts, and there were delays in diagnosing the source case because providers weren't thinking TB. So, yeah, could you speak louder, please?
The outbreak happened in Portland, Maine, which is a city of 64,000 people. It is named largest urban center. Uh, there are a number of, um, of services for homeless people in Portland, Maine, including two hospitals, a number of shelters, a health care for the homeless program, a soup kitchen, and a county jail. Our TB outbreak happened because medical providers were not thinking TB. Shelter policies were not in place. Shelters were not skin testing people routinely. Cough logs were not being kept. Shelters were crowded with poor ventilation and no plan for assessing symptoms in homeless people. There was only limited nursing presence in homeless shelters in Portland, Maine in 2003. Corrections policies had been developed, but they hadn't been fully implemented. After we got our outbreak under control, and by the way, we did have a 100% completion rate on our cases, and we had a 93% uh, percent completion rate on our um, reactors. We decided, among other things, that we needed to develop TB control recommendations that would be specific for Maine's mostly rural shelter programs. We developed a TB prevention toolkit to assist the shelter staff to implement the recommendations. And then we linked each shelter with a resource person to help them with the implementation process. We felt that it was important at the beginning of our process to engage the shelter providers themselves in wanting to understand the problem and wanting to be agents of change. We also felt they needed to reach beyond their own discipline of providing shelter services to collaborate with local jails and with other social service providers and medical providers of homeless services. We needed to conduct a shelter needs assessment, which we'll talk about more in a moment. And then we established a TB prevention shelter work group that developed our recommendations and toolkit. Then we provided implementation assistance to the shelters. Our needs assessment was critical to our process. We first engaged the shelter providers by attending local meetings that they were having about other things. We went to both statewide and local meetings. We also visited county jails to raise their awareness about TB among the homeless. We developed a questionnaire, and then we conducted shelter visits. Each shelter was visited by uh, a team that consisted of a regional epidemiologist and a local public health nurse. The questionnaire was administered and support services were offered on the local level by the epidemiologist and the nurse. This was pretty much a team building effort. I can't stress strongly enough the need to have uh, a needs assessment done before an intervention is developed. If we had developed our intervention without doing a needs assessment, we might not have known that most of our shelters had no nurses, and we might have developed an intervention that was directed toward nursing staff. After we had done our intervention, our needs assessment intervention, we realized that we really needed to address our recommendations to non-medical staff that were working in shelters. What we found out was that most of the guests in Maine's homeless shelters are U.S.-born people. They are pretty much local to the shelters where, the, to the communities where the shelters are located. There was not a lot of guest turnover. The shelter populations were stable in our shelters. There were very few nursing services available, as I mentioned. And most of the shelters in Maine were not screening either staff or guests for TB. The good news was that half of the shelters that were visited requested follow-up assistance with policy development. Once we had done our needs assessment, we'd set up a TB prevention work group during the winter of 2004. We used a six-month time frame 
and we kept our um, work group limited to that time frame. We identified and addressed the systems issues that the shelters were facing. We tried to have an interdisciplinary group, um, which was a combination of shelter providers, health providers, and health department staff. And the shelter recommendations and toolkit <clears throat> were actually developed by the work group itself. I want to take a moment to just mention the recommendations. This slide is just a summary of the categories in the recommendations. But the document itself is worth downloading because it is the document that is the background and rationale for the toolkit that we developed. It includes a summary of work group discussions and provides insight into TB prevention challenges from the perspective of the shelter staff themselves. The toolkit contains a number of sort of one-pagers that shelter staff can post in a workstation or in an office. The first one, what your shelter can do to prevent TB, is a one-page bulleted summary of the recommendations. And it's very clear direction for non-medical staff. And I'm going to give you an example of a couple of the bullets. One is maintain logs or bed lists and keep them for one year. Another is think about ventilation. Open doors and windows to promote air exchange especially in areas where guests congregate to eat, sleep, or watch TV. If your shelter has a mechanical ventilation system, be sure that it is functioning properly. That, those are just two of the bullets on, the, uh, on that sheet. The second sheet is assessing your guests' risk for TB. This is a seven-question checklist. It's a risk assessment. It's designed to raise awareness in shelter staff that, in fact, their guests may well be at high risk for TB and that complacency around TB prevention is really not appropriate. The third sheet is a cough alert policy, and I'm going to review that in a moment. The toolkit also contains posters and educational materials for shelter staff and guests. And then there is a targeted testing information summary for healthcare providers who work with homeless clients to evaluate them medically for TB. The sample cough alert policy is in the next four slides. I'm not sure how many people can actually see the slides, but these are very um, simple directives for shelter staff who may be observing guests and it's to remind them about looking for people who are coughing and not to attribute all cough to smokers cough which tends to be um, what people sometimes think. There's a checklist here. People can check off symptoms. If they find these symptoms, there are clear directions on what to do. Ask the guest to cover their mouth and nose using tissue, the sleeve, or a mask, move the guest to a separate sleeping area, and so forth. And then it reminds them how to arrange for a TB evaluation. We have uh, transportation barriers and geographic barriers in Maine. We don't have clinics very close to shelters in most cases. And so people might need help to make those assessments. And we're hoping that people will feel comfortable to call TB Control for help. My phone number is on there so that they can call and hopefully have a friendly voice at the end of the phone if they're stumped about what to do. We were trying to make it seem to the shelter staff that the health department is not an intimidating place to call. Just by way of process, I think whenever an intervention is developed, it's important to engage stakeholders in the process and to be sure they understand the problem and want to be part of the solution. It's also important to be inclusive and invite a multidisciplinary staff to be part of the solution and also to invite skeptics <clears throat> or people who might not be believe that there actually is a problem or might not feel they can be part of the solution to the table. 
It's important to invoke the knowledge of experts. We felt that we needed a physician on our team, and so we used our state epidemiologist, Dr. Gensheimer. We visited the shelter staff on their own turf. Some of our meetings were held in places where the um, people were already meeting for other purposes. We tried to address the barriers that the shelter providers themselves were identifying. And I think whenever people are working with the homeless population in the shelter uh, staff, it's important to realize that many shelter staff are formerly homeless people themselves or maybe in recovery. At the beginning of our process, we reached consensus on the goals and objectives and what we were trying to achieve with our work group. And we needed to remind ourselves that we had to work with the resources that we had. We really did not have funding to increase our services, so we needed to harness the resources that we had now, not what we might have in the future. We built on the work of uh, the Seattle group that had um, recently had a TV outbreak and had developed some shelter recommendations of their own and we adapted some of those recommendations to ours. I felt it was important not to waste people's time. We had a time limited process. We kept our meetings short to an hour and a half and we developed and assigned action items at each meeting. We developed a tangible outcome, a product, and, we, and those were the guidelines and the toolkit. So that is my presentation. I'd be happy to take questions, and I'll turn it over to Bill. Thanks very much, Suzanne. Uh, some of the questions that have come in are, what is a cough log? A cough log is something that um, I, I believe large shelters like the Pine Street Inn use in Boston, and that is a place where shelter staff who are actually posted or uh, working the night shift just listen to see who's coughing and make a note of that. And if people are coughing for more than three or four nights in a row, they need to see a provider. And it's just a way of staff uh, raising consciousness of staff and documenting who's coughing and who might need to be evaluated. Great. Thank you very much. I think that's helpful. Um, another question came in. Is, is a copy of the needs assessment questionnaire that you used available? The needs assessment summary is in the back of the recommendations document. Okay. Thank you very much. Another question came in regarding that large contact investigation where you said there were a thousand contacts and they're asking how many converters. There were actually 30 reactors that we found and 16 of those were converters. And um, so the, the, uh, we had a 93% completion rate on those folks. Okay. Um, let me throw it open now to anyone on the phone lines to call in with a question for Suzanne Johnson. Go ahead. Okay, I think that um, we could open it up now actually for questions for all of the panelists. So now is a chance for all of the listeners to either text us so I'll ask a question to Suzanne Gunson, Dr. Rhonda Hagler, or Paul Colson, who are all waiting here. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Hi. Uh, my name is Nick uh, Metropolis. I'm working for the uh, with the New York City Department of Health and <laughs> Control. Uh, Ms. Gunston, um, your uh, your two uh, uh, recommendations uh, mostly uh, well the questionnaire screening um, uh, uh, guests uh, who come into the shelter uh, and also environmental uh, recommendations uh, mostly it is my understanding concern uh, the guests and the residents uh, in the shelters. Uh, my question is: Have you 
uh, done any testing among the employees who work in the shelters, any screening to uh, see if there is any infection going on among them, uh, possibly uh, coming from the residents? We did screen, when we had the outbreak, we did screen um, all of the um, shelter staff in all of the shelters in, in the uh, city of Portland. And we did not find any skin test converters in that group. That was during the contact investigation? Yes, that is correct. Uh, any follow-up uh, in the years after to see if uh, any converters uh, uh uh, if you had any converters? We have, we still have a very large database of those 1,069 um, contacts in that contact investigation. And that database was set up by the CDC. It's an access-based database. And even four years later, I'm still doing some sort of passive surveillance, and I'm reviewing all of the skin testing results from the county jail and the shelters that are doing screening. And then we are able to, um, uh, we have found some, um, um, a lot of people that are on that contact list who are negative, but we have not find any, found any more converters. Okay. Thank you very much. The Health Department in Maryland. We had a question about we have rotating church shelters in our community, and we tried to do some outreach, but we found that the volunteers were very, um, you know, change volunteers frequently, but they also were very intimidated if you mentioned the word tuberculosis or screening. Um, do you have any approaches to get around this? I think it's important to just really talk to people, and the, and, the, and the human approach is very important. We found that by having our, our nurse and an epidemiologist visit the people and, and help them to understand the difference between TB infection and disease, um, that that was hugely important. One of the issues that we have here in Maine that other Northeast states may have is that shelters are very reluctant to exclude people if they need a chest X-ray and don't have and haven't had one, because in a rural area there is no other place for a person to go, and so um, people could actually freeze to death if they weren't allowed in the shelter. So that kind of raises anxiety among shelter staff, and that's why I think it's important to link uh, the shelter staff with a support person who's available to visit them. Question? This is Liz Zangrelli from Montgomery County in southeastern Pennsylvania. Can you hear me? Yes, here you're fine. My question is, what was the average length of stay for the shelter residents, and how did you deal with compliance in getting such a high compliance rate for your converters? We dealt with the, um, the conversion um, Issue by by we had we actually hired a homeless outreach nurse um, with some CDC funding, and that nurse was incredibly effective in forming the relationship that Rhonda spoke about earlier with patients. And she basically followed these people around, and she basically followed these people around, and uh, and, and actually looked for them, and was that and we used incentives very liberally and we just really babysat these people for nine months. Some of them actually had um, elevated liver functions and need to, have, need to have had their treatment interrupted and then they were restarted after their liver functions came back to normal and um, so we, we felt as though it was an extremely labor intensive effort but well worth it. Thank you. Hi, I'm Karen Galinowski, nurse consultant from New Jersey Department of Health and Senior Services. And this question pertains to the first presentation of working with 
people of sub who use substances and um, who are homeless. Okay. I, I have learned and I agree that developing a relationship with uh, this group of people or an, an in, uh, in, individual client is the most effective means of uh, treating this person, especially over a long time. Um, and there's a lot of emotional upheaval. But on occasion, when people like fall off of adherence, uh, you know, and, and I've used some threats of um, court order, DOT, legal intervention that have not worked at all. And I was wondering if you could give some advice as to the use of, um, I don't know, threats or interventions, I should say. Um, to deal with this population because it's, it's, it's difficult. You know how they may disappear a few days to use drugs and then come back. You'll find them. They'll call you if you have a good relationship with them. They'll call you and you're the only person, you're the only person they want to see. Um, and then you have to go find them and bring them into treatment again and it's this upheaval constantly. So I was wondering if you had any advice or recommendations. Uh, this is Paul Colson. I guess many of my remarks have been predicated on LTBI treatment, and I think also Dr. Hagler's, and obviously uh, Ms. Constance also, where obviously you don't have the same legal power in enforcing treatment that you do with active TB. And I assume, well, I'm not sure, are you, are you asking that on active TB? Because it, in my experience, talk to DOT workers in New York City, um, the threat is something they usually keep in their back pocket. They don't mention at the beginning of treatment or even if you're doing well that they have that power to force treatment. Um, and they only, then sometimes, you know, a person is being not adherent, then they mention, well, you know, listen, you might put me in the position where I have to call on these people and then they would be with you, sort of thing. Um, obviously, with our TBI treatment, we're really looking at the uh, the carrot and because there's not much of a stick there, um, so uh, yeah, that's how I, I guess I was suggesting is to nurture that relationship and 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 try to have a rapport between you and the client because you don't have that that stick behind your back. I uh, guess my uh, colleagues want to add in Dr. Hager or Ms. Uh, Hudson. This is uh, Rhonda. Um, you know, we're, I'm specifically dealing with LTBI treatment. I'm, I'm clearly not dealing with uh, the disease itself, and, and there's a whole other level of responsibility as far as treatment for the disease and then the follow-up for that. So I can only control what the fall said. It's obviously, you know, you do have another um, tool in your armor, which is the fact that we're coming to you from Methadone, and that's a powerful incentive. Yeah, I mean, that's the primary incentive is their addiction treatment services. But at the same time, we would never use the leverage of maintaining them on the program or continuing their treatment with the medically assisted treatment with methadone if they don't follow through with treatment for LTBI because, as you said, it's, you know, it's a carrot, and uh, we would never do that because, you know, as I said in one of the slides, we just respect the patient's right. Uh, to refuse that form of treatment. There are sometimes, however, I mean, in, in my particular clinic, we have actually used uh, a very forceful incentive when we feel that something is mandatory. If we have, as an example, if we have a patient who has mental health issues that are really going to be disruptive to the staff or to themselves, we mandate as part of their treatment that they have to see a mental health professional because we realize that the total treatment will be uh, derailed if they don't concentrate on this one effort. But the same is not, is not said for treatment for LTBI. Okay. Uh -huh. I, I'm, I'm glad you clarified that. I, I didn't mean to imply that you would threaten to withdraw uh, methadone maintenance. Um, but I guess I was just trying to say that, you know, by providing a, a thing that the patient wants, you can try to slip in another thing, which is LTBI. Exactly. I was about to say something. Uh -huh. Uh, this is Karen again. I was talking about disease, not LTBI, and and I know about the use of legal legal interventions. Um, some of these patients who use substances are uh, are uh, manipulative enough to know you know when non-adherence becomes an issue to, that you'd need to use legal interventions. So it's like uh, an emotional turmoil without the without getting the person into treatment. 
you know, it, I wondered if anyone had any suggestions. You're suggesting that somebody knows those guidelines well enough that they'll push it to the edge to where you would be required to do something yet then sort of come back into treatment and reply you like that. Is that what you're yeah. suggesting? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That, that's a complex question. I don't know if I have any quick answers for that. Well, I really enjoyed your presentation. Thank you. Can I uh, say something on this? Uh, here in New York, this is Nick Metropolis again. Um, here in New York, we have uh, the Bureau of TV Control does have a unit that uh, deals with uh, legal issues or um, patients who may become, um, if they don't take their medication, infectious and uh, dangerous to the public. Uh, and uh, uh, we have uh, procedures in place uh, which uh, help us to uh, really lock up patients uh, uh, of this nature and uh, force them to, to, to uh, complete their therapy. Uh, I don't know if you uh, can implement anything similar in your um, area. This is Bill Ball. I'm sorry I have to cut off this wild and exciting discussion, but this is all the time that we've allotted for the seminar today. I really want to thank very much the faculty, uh, Dr. Colson, Dr. Hagler, Suzanne Dunstan, for sharing your knowledge and experience with all of us. And I want to thank all of the participants for your questions, your input, and discussion. In fact, if you have additional questions, Please send them to me uh, by email or by phone. I will direct them to the correct panels, and you will get an answer. I also want to bring your attention to future courses, and it's, it's interesting to me that we ended on a, a term of uh, talking about legal interventions. Uh, it will be the subject of the third effective practices um, course, which will actually be in September of this year. And that will be on um, legal interventions in tuberculosis control. Um, you can see courses that are upcoming right now. We have, at the end of this month of March, um, a course on effective TV interviewing and contact investigation in Newark, New Jersey. And then the second of the best practices in TV control, which is titled What Works Best in Low Incidence Areas and Rural Settings. This will be a web-based seminar that will be in May of this year. You can see and register for these and all other course offerings from the Northeastern RCMCC at www.umdnj.edu slash global tv. In fact, uh, there's also through the Global TV Institute a uh, hotline that will answer all of your tuberculosis questions and you can see um, the information for that right here. I would like to remind all of the participants to send in the sign-in sheet and the continuing education information sheet to the address or fax that is noted on each form. And lastly, after this seminar, we will be emailing to you a Zoomerang link so you can answer the evaluation questions online. Um, the link is listed right here on this slide. Um, you also would have received it as part of the information that you got prior to the seminar. Please share it with those who have not signed in but are listening today. And for those who uh, would like to refer to it later, there will be a recording of today's program that will be posted on our website along with related conference materials. Um, these will include the resources that came from the state of Maine, from Dr. Hager, and from other RTNCCs, as well as the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. This concludes the conference, and thank you very much for your participation. Goodbye.